Well, one of the major changes, I think, will be with regard to the actual uh, transposition of the regulations um, in Ireland, or the, the transposition of the directives. Ireland is proposing to transpose these directives by means of very detailed uh, regulations. Uh, I've seen a copy of the regulations. There are about 102 provisions, about 80 or 90 pages. And um, this is a, quite a, a change from existing practice. Um, currently, uh, the, the, the directives have been transposed posed by um, st statutory instruments which basically say the directives are part of Irish law. But now the new regulations are much more detailed, so um, SMEs and contracting authorities will need to look at the particular regulations instead of looking to the directives. So that's, I think, one of the uh, significant changes um, that, that we're going to see in Ireland. A couple of other changes I think worth hi highlighting. Um, first of all, there's going to be an increased transparency with these uh, new directives, uh, particularly with regard to, for example, the whole idea of weighted criteria. Uh, one of the obligations in the new directives um, is that contracting authorities would publish the weightings uh, rela relating to each criteria. So, for example, pr if, if you're going to be giving price, say, 50 or 60 percent of the marks, you must say that in advance, either in the uh, tender notice or in the tender documentation. And that's quite a, a change, I think, um, in terms of uh, procedure in Ireland. We haven't really seen too much of that before. Is it going to make a big, uh, is it going to be of huge significance uh, to tenderers? Personally, I don't think so, um, because even though uh, the, the tender document may indicate that say price has got 50% uh, of the marks, quality only has 20% of the marks, uh, delivery date say has 20% of the marks. Um, the contracting authority still has flexibility as to how it's going to mark each of those criteria. So you often see um, in scoring matri matrices um, a spread say on um, price. So if the if the marks say are 30% or 40% of the marks, um, you might see one firm getting 100% of that, whereas the other firms only get 20 or 30%. Um, whereas on the other uh, criteria, like for example quality, often there's a very, the very small spread. At most firms will come in around the same level. So there's still quite a bit of flexibility there for contracting authorities to, uh, to, to, score, the, to score the tenders as they see fit. A couple of other changes I think worth uh, noting. Um, there's going to be, I think, a greater move towards centralised purchasing. We've already seen this in Ireland, for example, in the health sector. Um, we now have the health service executive, which does um, a lot of centralised purchasing. The new directives contain specific provisions relating to centralised purchasing. They basically say that um, any contracting authority acquiring true or from um, a central purchasing agency will be deemed to have uh, complied with the public procurement rules if that contracting authority has complied with the rules. And I think that is quite significant because, as I said, there is a greater move towards centralised purchasing, particularly in areas like the health uh, sector where there is a, a need to achieve value for money. Another important change, obviously, will be with, the, with regard to the whole area of competitive dialogue pr procedure, the competitive dialogue procedure. Um, and this procedure is aimed at kind of complex uh, projects. So uh, the classic example is the typical PPP or public-private partnership project, or uh, in the UK it's referred to as the PFI uh, project. Um, pri a private finance initiative project. And the competitive dialogue procedure in the new directives is kind of aimed at that type of procedure. Um, it's aimed at uh, opening up a dialogue um, with tenderers at uh, the beginning stage of the tender procedure uh, to allow uh, tenders to have an input into the specifications um, that the uh, contracting authority is going out to tender on. Um, will this have a significant impact on how PPPs are procured um, in, in Ireland and the UK? I think the answer is probably yes. I think there's going to be an increased use of this um, competitive dialogue procedure, um, not because um, it offers a huge degree of flexibility to contracting authorities in the way that they're going to procure, but more because um, there's going to be, um, it's going to be very difficult to bring procedures um, under the uh, circumstances for use of the negotiated procedure. And this has been one of the um, issues that has presented itself on several occasions in recent years, particularly with with regard to um, the, the, the use of the negotiated procedure in, in complex projects. So I think competitive dialogue procedure, we're going to see much more of it, but um, is it the answer to everybody's um, woes? I don't think so. Um, and the reason is because there
because there isn't going to be uh, flexibility for negotiations after the tender comes in. This was something that was uh, negotiated at, uh, in, in the European Parliament when the directives were going through. Uh, the UK in particular wanted um, to have negotiations in a competitive dialogue procedure after the tenders had been received, um, but unfortunately um, it never got through into the final directives. Um, so the, in this new competitive dialogue procedure, while there may be negotiations prior to tender submission, after tenders are submitted, um, there won't to be any flexibility for um, negotiations. So I think there, you know, the competitive dialogue, we're going to see a lot more use of it, but um, is it going to be the answer to all the problems? I don't think so. So those are, I think, the primary uh, changes that we're going to see. In my opinion, the Green Book and the guidelines are more um, a set of binding rules. I say this even though they are not considered to be legally binding. Um, but they do have consequences for a contracting authority who fails to comply with the guidelines. For example, if a contracting authority fails to comply with the guidelines, the Auditor and Controller General um, may um, initiate an investigation into the actual procurement procedure. Um, under the 2001 uh, Code of Conduct for the Governance of State Bodies, uh, there is an obligation in there for each contracting authority at the end of every budgetary year to send a letter to, the, to their relevant minister confirming that they have complied um, with the Irish guidelines and with EU public procurement rules where they're applicable. Um, if the uh, contracting authority fails to uh, send this letter to the minister, um, obviously there will be um, issues raised uh, from their budget perspective um, but also they may be called before an Oireachtas subcommittee uh, to give information with regard to why they haven't followed the procurement rules. There's been a very low level of cases um, in the Irish courts um, with regard to public procurement. There's been less than 10 uh, judgments from the Irish courts in regard to public procurement. I think the reason for this is uh, really time and cost factors, but also um, there is a, a, a very high standard of proof required in order to show that a contracting authority has, an, has acted um, in contravention of the public procurement directives. Um, in Ireland, we've had a case, the SIAC case, which basically said that um, in order for a tenderer to show uh, that a contracting authority has acted in contravention of the rules, they would need to show a manifest error on the face of the record um, to establish that the breach has occurred. This is a very high standard of proof and I think is one of the reasons why there have been a very low level of cases in the Irish courts. The European Commission has just recently uh, completed a consultation on uh, a, re a review of the Remedies Directive. As we know, there's recently been changes to the uh, Public Sector and Utilities directive, uh, Directives, which are currently being transposed into national law. But there is now um, a review of the Remedies uh, Directives going on at European level. And one of the calls uh, by the Commission in that consultation is for a national public procurement body in each member state. This national public procurement body um, would deal with uh, disputes outside of the courts and would um, be possibly equivalent to a body such as the Competition Authority in Ireland. And I think that a public procurement body would be a very useful entity to have, um, both from a purchaser's perspective and from a supplier's perspective. And I say this for a number of reasons. First of all, there's the time and the cost factors. I think it's important. it would be uh, useful for both uh, the pur purchaser and the supplier not to have to spend so much time and cost um, in the courts in order to either defend or prosecute or to, to litigate um, the procurement procedure. Uh, second of all, the, uh, con the public procurement authority would be able to establish a set of uh, guidelines or decisions, um, or there would be guidance maybe emanating from their decisions um, um, with regard to how contracting authorities have conducted their procurement procedures and whether they are in compliance with the public procurement rules. So I think that this is an area we're going to see um, some reform in. I think that we are going to see uh, public procurement, national public procurement authorities in member states in the coming years and I actually do think that this is a welcome development both from a purchaser's and a supplier's perspective. There's a number of issues that a purchaser has to uh, think about in drafting its pre-qualification questionnaire. 
For example, uh, it has to think about the, the level of financial uh, turnover thresholds that it will, it will be setting. Often a contracting authority will uh, set a threshold of, say, a, a 1 million euros. A, a tender has to have a financial turnover in the previous uh, financial year of 1 million euros. A lot of SMEs mightn't meet those thresholds, and it can exclude uh, quite a number of tenders from the process. So the contracting authority has to think about the level at which it wants to pitch um, its uh, financial and, and technical criteria at. With regard to developing scoring matrices, there has been a, a case from the European Court of Justice with regard to developing scoring matrices for pre-qualification procedures. In the Universal Sally Bao case, um, the contracting authority had developed a scoring matrix for a pre-qualification questionnaire um, in advance of publishing the contract notice in the official journal. It had then, de then deposited this uh, scoring matrix with a notary and, and hadn't circulated the uh, scoring matrix to tenderers. Uh, the case came before the Court of Justice and the Court held that the contracting authority should actually have submitted, the, uh, submitted this uh, scoring matrix to all tenders in advance. Um, this would have increased the transparency in the process. Tenders would have known what the weightings were for the pre-qualification questionnaires and uh, for the pre-qualification questionnaire and therefore probably would have been better able to answer the pre-qualification questionnaire. So I think scoring matrices um, often are one of the issues that arise uh, for contracting authorities um, in developing a pre-qualification questionnaire. In, in determining whether to bring an action in regard to uh, an apparent breach of the public procurement rules, um, the would-be litigant really um, should seek some form of debriefing from the, uh, contra from the contracting authority. Contracting authorities are obliged to give, uh, or to give suppliers and SMEs um, reasons as to why they haven't been successful in the tender procedure. However, however contracting authorities often uh, give very scant reasons as to why they've been unsuccessful, and uh, suppliers often use the Freedom of Information Act in order to obtain this information. In deciding whether or not to bring a lawyer to um, a debriefing meeting with the contracting authority, really the question is how serious is the alleged breach. If there is a very serious uh, breach of the public procurement rules, I would advise bringing a lawyer to that meeting. If there's only uh, a likelihood that there is maybe a small breach of the rules, generally it wouldn't be advisable to bring a lawyer because it can maybe bring the wrong tone to the meeting and the contracting authority mightn't be so forthcoming with the information. So, I think every every supplier or every purchaser sh or every supplier should be seeking um, information as to why they haven't been successful in their agenda process, and it's only uh, when they have that information should they be considering litigation. There are a number of fundamental principles that underlie the public, procure public procurement rules. These fundamental principles have been established by the European Court of Justice in a body of case law on the public procurement directives. Uh, in regard to the principle of equality of treatment, which is one of these fundamental principles which underlies the public procurement rules, there is an obligation on the contracting authority to treat all tenders equally. For example, in practice, this means that if a contracting authority responds to a particular tender with regard to, for example, a clarification on a tender document, it should be sending that clarification to all tenderers. Often contracting authorities will require that any clarifications with regard to tender document documentation be made in writing and any responses there, therefore are circulated to all tenders in writing. This ensures that the principle of equality of treatment um, is complied with. With regard to the principle of transparency, this has been the subject of a number of cases at the European Court of Justice. Um, in the Tele Austria case, the European Court of Justice held that the principle of transparency meant at the very least um, publishing an advertisement um, sufficient to ensure genuine competition so as to open up uh, competition in the services market. Now, the question is whether or not the principle of transparency actually goes beyond that and requires the uh, contracting authority to act in a transparent manner. Uh, in the new public procurement directives, Article 2 of the public sector directives um, states that there is an obligation on contracting authorities to act in a transparent manner. So it's arguable that actually this principle of transparency is wider uh, than an obligation to publish um, an advertisement notice um, in, for example, the official journal or in the national media. 
With regard to the principle of proportionality, this basically means that contracting authorities can't set uh, evaluation criteria or pre-qualification criteria which are disproportionate. So for example, if a contracting authority is building a small road, they can't set a financial uh, turnover threshold of say 20 million euros or 30 million euros when that financial threshold absolutely has nothing to do uh, with the subject nature of the contract. So proportionality often really relates to the, to the level at which uh, criteria, financial and technical criteria are pitched at.